Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to wish you a, a happy end to your Sukkot season. I know some of you probably don't even know what I'm talking about, but it's a wonderful time of remembering. Remembering what God has done. He led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years. They lived in a sukkah. Each one of them had their own sukkah, which is a tent or a, uh, a temporary dwelling. And uh, he took care of them all the time he was there. He provided for them. As we've come out of that era and uh, commemorated it from year to year, because of the time it falls, it's at the time of the fall ingathering or the final ingathering of the year. Amen. The final ingathering of the agricultural year. So uh, it's a time to remember that God is faithful. In fact, if you receive uh, our emails, if you're on our email list, uh, we'd be happy to, uh, I mean, you will have already received a, a short, almost an outline teaching on Sukkot this year. And uh, we sent that out yesterday. If you'd like to be on that list, all you have to do is uh, write to me, uh, email me, terry at livingwordcf.org. That's for Christian fellowship, in case you didn't understand the, the CF in there, livingwordcf.org. Terry at livingwordcf.org, and you can request to be put on that on that uh, email weekly list. We send out a weekly, weekly uh, message, a weekly teaching, and uh, we relate Torah portions to the truths of the newer covenant that Jesus taught. That's what we want to do in all of those. So be glad to send them to you. I, I want to say again today, thank you to all of you who are givers and who have given into this ministry. Uh, we don't look at it as a, uh, as a requirement at all, but uh, some of you have decided that you wanted to support us, and we appreciate it very much. There are uh, methods to do it that you can send them. You can send checks, right, pay payable to Living Word Christian Fellowship, and address them to P.O. Box 729 in Grand Lake, Colorado, 80447. You can find all this stuff on our website, which again is www.livingwordcf.org. Or there's even a, a PayPal uh, link that you can send them to. And uh, we just appreciate all of you that have helped and all of you that are giving. And I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, uh, our giving has not dropped off. Praise God. It's, uh, it's continuing. And I believe the last time I checked it, it had even increased a small amount. And praise God, we're, we're, we're thinking that's a victory in and of, its, of itself. Praise God. So today I want to continue what we began last week, and that is in this series, Be Filled with the Spirit. The first message I talked to you in that one was last Friday, and uh, I, I want to say on this Friday, Shabbat Shalom, as we head into another uh, Sabbath, another time of rest, we're going to be teaching... Uh, following up on last week's beginning one, which was about being hungry, hungry, or having an appetite for the things of God. And God wants to instill an appetite in His people. Praise God. He says in Psalm 34, verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. O taste and see that the Lord is good. I related to you last week how I tasted when I was 10 years old that the Lord was good. I not only tasted of the new birth, which is, uh, you might say the new birth opens up your spiritual taste buds. You begin to be able to taste things. God can give you a certain appetite before that time, but primarily He's just drawing you into Himself, drawing you, and He uses all kinds of methods to do it. And when you pray for people, always pray that their eyes will be opened and that their ears will hear the things that God's trying to show them because what He wants to do is get you to a place where you can be born again and become a new creation. And as a new creation, you can taste and see 
that the Lord is good. In that taste that I had, I saw that he not only wants people to be born again, but he also wants people to be healed. I saw that at that uh, gymnasium in Strasburg in 1954. Praise God, what a, what a blessing that was to my life. That was the place where my life turned around, and even though I spent some time wandering after that, it is the time I look back to as the date of my birthday when I was born again into the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. As we've talked about this, we looked at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 through 21. Actually, I'm not going to go quite that far today, but just looking again at that, at that scripture in Ephesians 5, we'll start through it. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. I want to tell you that right now, in the day in which we live, people call them uncertain times. Well, the fact is, all of our times are uncertain if you look to the things of the flesh. There's uncertainty all around us. But we live in a time when there's great pressure. There's great pressure right now. And it's important that we learn to look carefully how we walk. The Bible says, not as unwise, but as wise. I believe there's something so key to that. Unwise is looking to yourself for answers. Wise is looking to God. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. So look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Looking uh, at, at uh, the Amplified Bible in that, it says, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days are filled with evil. Well, you all don't have to look very far to see that. Every one of us can see that we live in days in a fallen world, a world that is still full of a lot of people that aren't born again, uh, people that actually have become uh, puppets of the enemy himself and don't even know it. Some of the people, so-called intelligentsia of our time, those uh, university professors, those, those people that are taking our children and brainwashing them uh, against the things of God, are puppets of the enemy. And uh, he's using this time to brainwash people against the things of God. So at this time, you need to be making the best use of your time. Scripture says in the 18th verse, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness. This is the Amplified Bible again. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness corruption, stupidity, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Say that with me. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe this drunk with wine thing is just one of the multitude of things that people get drunk on. They get drunk on power. They get drunk on self. They get drunk on lust. They get drunk on all kinds of things, but the fact is, all of the things they get drunk on, really, if you get right down to it, they're substitutes. People want to get high on things. But the fact is, there's a better way. God says, it is. Don't use the substitution. Don't use the counterfeit. But use the real thing that can get you where God wants you. God's very best for you. God's plan for you. God's way of doing things is to be filled. And this is for all of his people. He wants them all filled with the Holy Spirit, and constantly guided by Him. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We know that's a fact. God does want us to eat the good things. That's what Proverbs talks about. Eat good things. Eat things that, that matter. Eat good things. Amen. Praise God. In Ephesians, Chapter 5, 18 in the King James, it calls this excess. That is excess. Excess. Well, you know, that's one of the things that marks our generation. We're excessive. People get excessive about everything they get involved with. 
people get excessive about everything. Everything they do, it, it seems they become obsessed with what they do, activities. And most of the activities there's nothing wrong with. But many of the activities are, again, substituting for getting close to God. And that's when we run into problems. That's when we have problems. Some of the very close ones in my life spend all of their time doing other things and don't have time for their God. If you talk to them about it, and I'm just talking real truthfully because this is not just the ones I'm talking about that are close to me, people that I know well, people that I love and care about, people that are even members of my own family, have gotten so occupied with other things that they don't have time for that which is really important. You remember what Jesus told Mary? He said, Mary, Mary, or Martha, Martha, I'm sorry, what he told Martha about Mary. He said, Martha, Martha, you're cumbered about with much doing. <laughs> Mary has chosen that good thing, and it will not be taken from her. We need to sit at Jesus' feet, amen? That's what we really need to do. And the Bible says we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Scripture says that. The Holy Spirit is who told us that we needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. A lot of religious people get all stuck up on drunkenness, and they can preach entire sermons about how evil alcohol is. Well, I'm not against uh, those kinds of messages. I mean, I think we need to know that, that uh, drunkenness is wrong. I believe we do need to know that, but really that's not part of the good news. The good news is, and this is the last part of this, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because without the good news, without the gospel, without Jesus coming and dying on the cross for our sins, without Him showing us at the very beginning that He could do nothing without the Father and He was filled with the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't know this good news that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. There wouldn't be a way that we could be filled with the Holy Spirit. But praise God, that's part of the good news. That's part of the gospel, to be filled with the good news. As I said, we talked about appetite last week. We said it was a part of your soul. The soul man actually is a part, has appetites. He has appetites. But you know, one thing I found out a long time ago, uh, you may have even remember the ad about uh, potato chips a few years ago. Uh, the ad started with a bet. Bet you can't eat just one. Bet you can't eat just one. Why would that be? Because eating one would whet your appetite for what you're eating. Well, I want you to know that God's that way. The things of God are that way. The more you taste them, the more you're, uh, the more you're uh, exposed to them, the better they get, the more you want the more you need. Amen? It's an appetite. We get hungry through tasting. Just through a little taste, many times we get hungry and say, mm, I'll have some more of that. I'll have some more of that. Well, let's do that with God. Amen? Amen. Well, the Lord knew that was going to happen to us. His plan from the very beginning, from the foundation of the earth, was that Jesus would die for our sins. We know that. The Bible says that very clearly. But did you know it also says that what He has given for us was all done from the foundation of the earth. What he's given for us, not just, not just uh, Jesus dying, but what that entailed throughout all of eternity and what that loosed for us, what that gave us, was all through that very thing. And uh, when he had risen from the dead, when Jesus had risen from the dead, on the very day that he had risen from the dead, you remember that he, he was seen by men walking on the road to Emmaus. Those men came back after they realized who he was and told the disciples who were gathered in Jerusalem that they had seen the Lord. And then while they were still talking, Jesus appeared in the midst of them. Jesus appeared and he showed them his hands and he showed them his feet. We know that according to the first, in that first meeting, Thomas was absent. Thomas wasn't at that meeting. He showed up at a later one, but it, we know that he appeared at least three times, but I, I think we can see more. Well, we know because at one time it says this is now the third time that he appeared unto them after he had risen from the dead. 
But in this night, something very significant happened. In fact, it's passed over almost uh, by some people. They just go right past it and never see what he did. The scripture said that he did something that was reminiscent of what God, Jesus, had done in the Garden of Eden when he came to Adam and Eve. You read about that. You find out about that. We'll look at it a little bit later. But we know that in the Garden of Eden, the first thing God did when he made men, he made men, he fashioned men, he took man and lifted him to his very mouth and breathed on them or breathed into them the breath of life. And man became a living or a, uh, a spirit life is what he became. A living soul, the script, scripture says. The reason they were a living soul was because living indicates the presence of the spirit. The true life indicates that. Death indicates separation from the things of the spirit. You need to get that down and understand it. It's not just when your heart quits beating. It's when you're separated from God and separated from the things of the Holy Spirit. But this particular night, Jesus in fashion, and he did so many things that were uh, actually uh, a reliving and reclaiming of what had been done previously. When he was with these disciples that night, he breathed on them. What did he do? Well, we could say he breathed into them the breath of the new birth. He said to them, receive the Holy Spirit, or inhale. That's how, how the picture would be here. If he's breathing out, what do we do? We breathe in, and we receive the Holy Spirit. I believe with all my heart, everyone that was there that night, everyone that was in his presence that night when this happened was born again. I believe the new birth was manifested among his disciples and from them on out to everyone else, but for the first time among them that evening in that room when he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And their spirit was made alive with the Holy Spirit that night. And with that, it was raised with new senses. <laughs> now I know... Some of you say, where did you get that? Well, if we read scripture, we find out that we have eyes that are not physical eyes that we can see with, and we have ears that are not physical ears that we can hear with. And I happen to know, I've experienced, that I can sense by touch. It's a different kind of touch. It's an inner touch. I can receive and sense that touch feeling of touch. It's been reported among some people that in some times they are able to detect by the Spirit the aroma of sweetness, a sweet aroma that comes in the presence of God. Amen. And it's the Lord that told us to taste and see. I believe there's a, a new sense of taste that comes to those who have been born again. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus didn't finish this that way because right at the very same time he spoke to them, this comes out of the book of Luke, you understand that the different ones of the Gospels report sometimes different things about the same event. And this one comes in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49 when he told them, you remember that night he asked them if they had anything to eat and he actually ate a piece of fish with them. And that night he said, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. I want you to hear that. He said, Stay in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Now there's a good reason to believe that they didn't all do this. In fact, Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they ended up in Galilee. But Jesus appeared to them also 
on the Sea of Galilee. Do any of you remember the 153 fish that Peter caught? When he cast his net out on the other side as Jesus stood on the shore and instructed him? Well, that was in Galilee, and that also happened after Jesus had been raised from the dead. He gave them instructions to stay in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from on high. But in his own self, Peter said, you know what? I've been born again. I believe with all my heart. I believe that Jesus is Lord, but I'm going fishing. Some people believe that he meant I'm going back to my profession as a fisherman. Now, whether that's true or not, I am not 100% sure, but I do know the rest of the disciples said, we're going with you. And they went to the place in Galilee, and Jesus spoke to them. But you need to understand, he told them at, in the room where they were meeting that night, stay in the city, stay in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power. What does that mean, clothed with power? Well, there's something different about being clothed with power from on high and just having a momentary burst of power. You know, the Lord can do things through us momentarily, but he can also clothe us with his power. And I want you to know this clothing that we're talking about here is not just clothes of uh, temporary nature, but it is a permanent clothing with power from on high. And we know that because of the way Jesus received his power from on high. John said, I saw the Holy Spirit descending on him and remaining upon him. And from that time, Jesus moved forth in a ministry of power. Of power. Say power. Jesus also said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Now he's saying this to the people that he breathed on in the upper room. I call it an upper room because it's been called that so much. We really don't know where that room was for sure. There apparently were upper rooms on a lot of the houses, but they were in a room someplace when Jesus appeared to them, and he told them, stay in Jerusalem until that time. Now he's telling them about this, and I believe this is at a different time, may have even been in Galilee. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I mean to tell you, he's telling there's something more coming after you've been born again that will give you power. If there was ever a time in the lives of believers that they need to be empowered to be witnesses. A uh, witness in the scripture uh, comes from the word, mar the same, we get the word martyr from it. Uh, and really and truly, I think a lot of people have decided if you're a witness for Jesus, you're going to have to be beheaded or you're going to have to die. Well, that's going to happen to some. That is going to happen. It's happening right now. There are places in the world right now where the Boko Haram has, uh, this evil, evil force from the enemy has come in and is beheading Christian pastors. But I want you to know uh, there's a way in which every believer is called upon to be a martyr. To be a martyr. And that comes out of Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. <laughs> Amen. I believe there are going to be a lot of living martyrs. Living martyrs because Jesus died. But we have to come to the place where we lay down our lives for him. You will be my witnesses. I want to lay down my life for you in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and where we are right now to the end of the earth. Amen. Somebody said the end of the earth may be New Zealand. I don't know where it is, but I'm telling you, uh, we're, we're on the way to the end of the earth. If we're not the end of the earth, we don't know what Jesus was talking about, but I believe he's just saying take this message everywhere as my witnesses. My martyrs, my martyrs who are living witnesses, witnessing the things of God. I don't know about you. Well, I guess I do know about you. I know exactly about you. You're just like I am. When you try to operate within yourself, you fall short. And I want to tell you this for sure. If you try to bypass what Jesus said, and people are doing this all the time, saying, well, I really don't believe he meant this. Or I really don't believe this is for today. 
Well, I want you to know this is a time today that is as great a time of testing and trial as has ever been on the earth, and it's heading to a time when Jesus said it'll be the greatest time of testing that the world has ever known. He said, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. That's the greatest time. Do you believe that we might need power at that time? Say, I need power. Say, Lord, give me power. I need the power that you have provided. I want your power in me. Send the power. Send the power and breathe it into me right now. I receive it in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, receive the Holy Ghost, the new birth, but now he's telling us there's there's something greater to come. There's something greater to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said it this way. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart. This is actually just a few verses before you will receive power. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. These are the guys that he already breathed on. They were born again. Now he's telling there's a promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me. Hallelujah. This he said, this he said, you heard from me. Did he tell us about it? Yeah, he told us, wait for it. Wait for it. You will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. You've heard this from me. You've heard it from me. You heard it in Luke 24, 49. I'm sending the promise. I'm sending the promise. He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. Why? They needed power. Did Peter have power when he went off with the disciples to go to Galilee? Apparently not. Apparently not. Because this date, this date where Jesus said, wait for it, Hadn't happened yet. It hadn't happened yet. It happened in Acts 2, 4, 2, 1 through 4. But I want you to know that what I just did a minute ago is what everybody needs to start doing. If you're a believer, if you're a new creation in Jesus Christ, you need to start doing this. You need to decide right now, I need this. <laughs> I, Lord, whatever it entails, whatever the Bible says is mine, I want it all. I want it all. Say, I want it all. Say, I'm willing. Say, I will receive. I will wait for what you said was coming. Amen. He said, I'll wait for it. I'll wait for what you said is going to come. Amen. 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 You know, looking at that a little bit, we need to understand that Jesus had already told us how this works. If we ask Him, for the Holy Spirit. If we ask for the Holy Spirit, say, if I ask for the Holy Spirit. Now, what it, read it with me. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now, you say, well, I don't know if he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, let's read on. He said, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Remember, we said that's fish, is, a, is food. It's food. It's good food. But a serpent isn't good. It's unclean. Said, so the father, which, which earthly father, if his son asked for a fish, would even say, no, you take this serpent and eat it? Or if he asked for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion, a stinging creature. No. If he asks for an egg, he's going to give him an egg. He's not going to give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, who are of this world, we could say, if even, the, even those who aren't born again know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give what? Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. Ask Him. I, you know, last week we tried to let the Holy Spirit instill in you. We, we were, were, were using our voice so that the Holy Spirit could call you to a new hunger for God. This week I want you to get real specific about it. Ask for the Holy Spirit. Ask the Father to fill you with His Holy Spirit biblically. Not according to any 
denomination standard, but according to what the Bible says about it. We won't have time today to go into everything, but if you're getting hungry about it, you don't have to wait. You can go right ahead and continue in this. You can learn of the Lord. In fact, I really, I really desire for you to go beyond what I do. Rabbinic teaching is always like this. They take parts of verses knowing that the people who hear those parts of verses or parts of scriptures will search them out and find out what the context is. We want you, we try to give you as much context as we can, but we want you to know that, you know, what you seek for is going to be more valuable than what you just sit back and say, well, give it to me. If you'll seek for it, if you'll seek him, if you ask, you will receive. If you knock, it will be given unto you. If you seek, you will find. Amen. God wants you to see that and go to that place. I want you to understand what's going on. I want you to also understand that even though Jesus said this is the Father that you, this is the gift from the Father that you've heard of me, John tells us, John the Immerser tells us, John the Baptist tells us, that Jesus is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Let's read it, John 1.33. This is at the day at the Jordan River when Jesus came to him to be baptized. He said, I myself did not know him. In other words, I didn't know he was Messiah. I did not know that he was God's anointed one. But he who sent me to baptize with water. Who sent John to baptize with water? Was it the high priest in the temple in Israel that sent John to baptize with water? No, he actually had a problem with John. He didn't really even much like him. No, the Bible tells us, if we read about John when he was born, that Zechariah said that according to the Scripture, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, or it was told to Zechariah, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. So who sent John to baptize with water? The Holy Spirit. And that's who sent me, the one that sent me, said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain. Do you remember I said? He'll remain on you. He will stay with you. Well, that's what being clothed with power is. It's a remaining on us. But he says the one that can do that, when you see this Spirit of God descend and remain, this is he, and that was Jesus, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. The Father promised it. It comes from the Father, but Jesus is the baptizer. Amen. He says the promise comes from the Father. You've heard about it through me, but John explains to us it's Jesus who actually immerses us or who clothes us or who rubs this precious anointing of the Holy Spirit all the way through us. <laughs> Amen. It's he that does that. John does it. This is the new creation power, and you can see that this was the restoration of the Genesis 1:28 account when Jesus said, when Jesus, I actually believe it was Jesus who was in the garden. I pre-incarnate, I believe that he was there with them in the garden. I believe that he was with John I mean, with Adam and Eve, when they were nothing but just a beautiful body that had been made, created. Amen. But then he breathed into Adam. He breathed into Adam the breath, the breath of life. And as he breathed, he said, just like he did when he breathed on them in the upper room, he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. When he breathed on them in the garden, he spoke this blessing, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and have dominion in it. We are God's standard in the earth. Amen. We're God's standard in the earth. Not as individual earthly people, but as spirit-filled people. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, how many can see that he's coming in right now? He comes in like a flood. 
You could maybe repeat that and say, well, when he comes in like a flood, like a greater flood, I will lift up a standard against him. And that standard is us. We're his line. We're his people. We're the ones that he's called. He's the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. You've got new creation power in you right now. Now, let it come even further. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, begin to understand what you have. It's something more important than you have ever realized. You say, how can you say that about me? You don't know everything about me. I want you to know that none of us have fully realized the greatness of what's on the inside of us. It is the living God who lives within us. Amen. I, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians 3. And I want you to start with verse 4 with me. Going backwards again. We'll get there. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 4. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. The Apostle Paul is speaking by the Holy Spirit to the people in Corinth, telling them, you know, that God, His name was written in them. That they actually had an imprint of God in them. And he says, such is the confidence that we have through the Messiah toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything. In other words, Paul had preached the gospel to all of Asia and all of Achaia and uh, all of that area around about to Macedonia. He had preached the gospel in those places. But he recognized, and we've been talking about this on Sunday morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that he didn't do it in his own power. He did it by the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Well, here in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, he says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency. Say sufficiency. How many know our God is sufficient? In fact, I want to go beyond sufficient. Our God is more than enough. He is more than enough. Our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient, or you might say he has made us able to be ministers of a new covenant. That's us. That's not just the apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers. That's every believer. He's made us all. He's talking to people that were people that have been born again and filled with the Spirit through His ministry. And He said they, He's made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. If I had an hour, I could not exhaust this topic, but I could tell you that what the Jews knew up until, until that time, what the children of Israel knew up to that time, was a written Torah, and that the scribes and Pharisees, the lawyers, and those lawyers were not attorneys, they were people who studied the law. In fact, they studied the law of sin and death. That's what they studied. Not of the letter, which is what they taught. They taught that letter over and over again. You may have seen this at the Wailing Wall. You may have seen pictures of people with a siddur, which is a prayer book. This is actually a Bible, but they have a siddur. And they face that Wailing Wall, and they recite over and over in Hebrew words, the words of the prayers that are in their siddur. In their book, they do it with davening. And it is a very ritualistic thing that they're doing. And they sing those and chant those words over and over. You may have seen that. Well, this is what the people of Paul's day who were Israeli knew. And the people who were in Corinth were idolaters. They didn't even have that much. So when they saw the letter of the Word of God, they got excited. But Paul makes a statement that is outstanding. Or you could say astounding. <laughs> Amen. The letter 
What? This letter, just the words written here, by themselves, and they have been throughout the ages used to start wars. They have used, been used to browbeat people that don't do right rather than give them good news. He says the letter kills, but the Spirit, say the Spirit. The Spirit gives life. This is why I'm talking to you as I am today, because the Holy Spirit says my people need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit gives life. In fact, when the Spirit is in the letter, the letter becomes living. Amen. When you take this Word of God and by the Spirit minister this Word, and God said, I'll even go beyond putting it on pages. I'll put it on the fleshy tables of your heart. And when you speak it that way, the Spirit gives life. Oh, hallelujah. The Spirit of God is life-giving. It's a living thing. It's a living thing. Now, if the ministry of death, and that's talking about the law of sin and death that is contained in the written pages of Torah, that law that tells you all the curses, all of the curses that come, carved on letters of stone. Yes, there are blessings there. The law of the spirit of life is there too. But the, the ministry of death was what was keyed in on. And it was carved in letters of stone and it came with such glory that the Israelites, remember after Moses had received it and came down from the mountain, they could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory which was being brought to an end. What glory is that? The glory of the written word only. The glory that was in those engraved stones. God says the day is coming when I'll write my laws in your heart. They'll become living. Living word. Living word. Christian Fellowship is presenting this message to you today. He says if that's the case, that that had a lot, that much glory when it was written on stone, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, Romans 8, 2 says, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Condemnation, condemnation. How many know that Romans says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Romans 8, 1 tells us that. No condemnation. Why? Because the law of the Spirit of life the living word, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed in glory. People, I'm telling you today, if you don't know you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're missing it. You're missing it. Some of you may have been taught so many years against this. Some of you may have been told lies through religious uh, dogma, just accepted things that people have taken that really aren't God's word, they're man's word. Some of you may have done that, but I want to call you out of it today. If you've heard truth come out of me and recognize that the truth is in me, recognize that I would under no circumstances ever lead you astray, but even far beyond what I can do for you. The Bible says if you ask for the Holy Spirit from our Father, He won't give you anything except something good. He will give the Holy Spirit to them who ask Him. Amen? Is that you today? Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you for the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Those of us that have experienced what it is to be filled with the Spirit are asking you, Lord, more, more about Jesus would I know, more of the living Word in me, more understanding more revelation. And for those that have never yet been filled, Lord, my, I see your promise to them. And I know that they have a hunger for the things of the Spirit of God. They're not any longer just natural men. They're born again people. They know the Word of God is true. They know that Jesus is coming soon. They know that the things that He's written about the days that are upon us right now, days that our troublesome days, troublesome times have come. They know 
that he wouldn't lead them astray. And in this time, they need the power. Oh, Lord, send the power to them right now. Send great power to your people. We praise you for it and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.